thank you very much. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, like other speakers before me, I'll lead workshops. So this is work in progress. And it's not on um, Wittgenstein's philosophy of mathematics um, directly. Uh, it's actually on um, the role that certain remarks that Wittgenstein makes about mathematics play within, indeed, uncertainty, since I'm a third Wittgenstein person, right? Um, so, um, I think that if we look at Wittgenstein's development throughout uh, his entire career, but particularly after the Tractatus, after uncertainty, we certainly witness the uh, uh, the broadening of the category of the grammatical, which in the middle period writings comprises prepositions once on color or an object that can be up to different events at once, to uh, arrive at uncertainty where um, certain propositions that had the appearance of empirical propositions, like the hearse has existed for a very long time, for instance, um, has that to play a grammatical role, a rule-like role. And in the, you know, in, in the process of widening the scope of the grammatical, if you will, or of what would count as a rule, I think that Wittgenstein is making important comparisons between what you know, certain calls hinges, like the heart has existed for a very long time, and certain very trivial and uh, mundane mathematical truths or propositions because the issue is not like two times two equals four <coughs> and the like. Several uh, interpreters, several scholars have taken these remarks at face value as occurring in uncertainty and have claimed straight that you know there are for victims to mathematical hinges. That is, certain mathematical statements that are different for Wittgenstein from any other mathematical statement. I don't think this is right, but as I said, I'll plead workshop, and these are very much this is very much work in progress, so you might convince me of the opposite. I don't think there are mathematical hinges. I think rather that Wittgenstein uncertainty is making a comparison with, between what he regards as hinges outside mathematics and these mathematical propositions only to uh, make the point he's interested in making, namely that uh, these hinges, despite being or looking like empirical propositions play an altogether different role, and they are much more solid, as it were, and hard and fossilized, like propositions of mathematics. Um, which areas should I use? Okay. No? Okay. Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. So, this? yeah. Um, so, as I said, uncertainly there are several remarks in which Wittgenstein discusses simple mathematical propositions like 2 times 2 equals 4, or 12 times 12 equals 144. And one may wonder whether he thought that these mathematical trivialities, much like G. Moore's truisms in a defense of common sense, could be examples of hinge propositions. Now, if they were, they would have to be importantly different from other mathematical uh, propositions because of the peculiar role they would have to play. So to get a sense of the difference, they would have to play a role like the one that the proposition the hearth has existed for a very long time uh, plays with respect to ordinary propositions about the past, such as the hearth as it, uh, sorry, there were dinosaurs on the hearth over 230 million years ago. 
So what's the idea here that we find in uncertainty? The idea is that propositions like there were dinosaurs on the Earth over 230 million years ago are open to verification and control and may turn out to be true or false. Whereas the proposition the Earth has existed for a very long time is not open to such verification and control. And indeed, for Wittgenstein, in uncertainty, it is neither true nor false. Or if it is true, it is true in an entirely empty sense, as Mary McGinn puts it. Or Michael Williams <coughs> talks about the minimal truth or a deflationary truth that would be enjoyed by hinges. Indeed, according to Wittgenstein, hinges play a role like role. He says so, you know, certainly in 95. While ordinary empirical propositions do not. Now, if there were mathematical hinges, they would have to play such a normative function, while other mathematical propositions should not be akin to rules. The trouble, however, is that for Wittgenstein, at least on the Vulgata, that is the, you know, the usual way in which you might give first pass of Wittgenstein's view, all mathematical propositions are rules, and allegedly false ones, like 2 plus 2 equals 5, are, are in fact meaningless, not really false. Thus, in the realm of mathematics, as Wittgenstein thought of it, at least on this uh, Ugata, it seems we don't, we don't have a contrasting class with respect to which we could say that only some mathematical propositions would have a hinge status. Of course, one might reject Wittgenstein's own conception of mathematical propositions as rules to maintain the more traditional view that they are general propositions subject to truth and falsity. Or else, one may dispute the Vulgata and offer a different interpretation of Wittgenstein's views on mathematics. I think that some people here would be inclined to do that, not all of us. In that case, however, one would still be left with the task of explaining why only some mathematical propositions or statements, this is a problem having to do with how to translate such, uh, like 2 times 2 equals 4 and 12 times 12 equals 144, would be rules which are neither true nor false, or if they are true, they are so in an entirely empty sense. So one would be left with the problem of explaining what would make such a subclass of mathematical propositions special. We then seem to be caught in a dilemma, for on the Bugata concerning Wittgenstein's views of mathematics, there is no clear distinction between, as it were, normal or ordinary mathematical propositions and mathematical hinges. In contrast, on a different understanding of mathematical propositions, the distinction could be drawn conceptually. So we could differentiate conceptually between ordinary mathematical propositions and these subclass of mathematical propositions that would play a, a rule-like role. But it would be difficult to maintain that the examples that Wittgenstein gives in uncertainty uh, could be used to exemplify that side of the distinction, the hinge side of So what I'll do next is to explore the issue further to see where it leads. And I've already anticipated that ultimately what I would like to propose, maybe, and it may be open to revision, so you might convince me of the opposite, is that for Wittgenstein, these examples here, these propositions here, are not examples of hinges, of mathematical hinges. They are just objects of comparison that he introduces in the dialectic to make a different point about the only hinges he cared about in uncertainty, which are the other ones, like the hearth has existed for a very long time and many more. Okay. <coughs> so, <coughs> apart from examples, and uncertainty contains plenty of them, to the point that there is a real issue of demarcation of hinges, if we look at the myriad examples that Wittgenstein gives in uncertainty, they are by no means a uniform category, we can individuate a few criteria that distinguish hinges from ordinary empirical propositions for Wittgenstein. 
The set of criteria is itself object of debate among Wittgenstein scholars interested in particular in uncertainty. But some distinctive criteria have elicited consensus, at least among proponents of the so-called framework reading of uncertainty, which to date, uh, my opinion, is the most accurate reading from an exegetical point of view. So people that have maintained this kind of reading are Mariana Yasharov, Mary McGinn, Christian Wright before 2004, and indeed myself. So what are these criteria? Hinges play a normative role. Now there are two senses of of norm here, or normative role. The, one, the first one is that they may play in context a meaning constitutive role. So in this kind of setting, if I say, here's my hand, and you know, if I doubted of that, it would become doubtful that I understand the meaning of the word hand. Similarly for um, when we say, for instance, something like this, is a physical object. For Wittgenstein, we should interpret that as a piece of linguistic instruction. But there's also another sense of norm. Some propositions are normative in the sense that they are norms of evidential significance. The hearth has existed for, a very, existed for a very long time. It's not so much a meaning constitutive norm. It doesn't give you the meaning of the word earth, as it were. But uh, it tells you what has to stay put, what has to be taken for granted. If we then want to use our ordinary evidence, for instance, falses and other kinds of evidence, to bear onto the determination of the truth value of ordinary propositions about the past, like uh, there were dinosaurs on the earth 230 million years ago. If we doubted that the earth has existed for a very long time, then even if we had those falses and the things that we normally take to prove something about the past, then those very pieces of evidence would lose their status. So in that sense, the earth has existed for a very long time is a norm. Not a norm that constitutes meaning, but rather a norm that it allows you to to use certain evidence as evidence for the determination of uh, the truth value of certain empirical propositions. Um, second, hinges for Wittgenstein cannot be epistemically justified. And that may be for two different reasons, depending on the hinge on the proposition we are considering in, in uncertainty. One reason why that might be the case is because all evidence <coughs> would presuppose them. So that is obviously in the case of the earth has existed for a very long time, um, and also for other propositions such as there are physical objects that Wittgenstein considers in uncertainty. They have to stay put in order for our ordinary, for instance, sensory evidence to be brought to bear on the determination of the truth of an empirical proposition like there are chairs in this room. If I doubted that there are physical objects, I could have all this sensory evidence, and yet that wouldn't justify me in believing that, um, that there are chairs. Or else, in some other cases, uh, these propositions, these hinges, cannot be justified because the evidence we would uh, produce in their favor would not be any more certain. Or, in other words, the proposition that we would try to substantiate by producing this evidence would, wouldn't be any more certain after we have produced the evidence in its favor than it was before. That's what he seems to drive at when he considers examples such as here's my hand in more like in a more like context or my name in my case is Annalisa Kuliva. It's not more certain for me that my name is Annalisa Kuliva after he produced my passport in ordinary circumstances. So that evidence as it were not doing anything, it's not corroborating the truth of that proposition for me in that context. 
Of course, there can be other contexts in which that may be the case. And in these cases, if knowledge is predicated of hinges, then it is not the expression of the obtaining of an epistemic relationship between a subject and a proposition or a fact, but rather is the expression of what Wittgenstein calls, in certain passages of uncertainty, <coughs> objective certainty. And the remark, I know, for instance, I know that my name is Annalisa Kuliva, I know that there is my hand here, and so on would play what he calls in Uncertainty 58 a grammatical role rather than an epistemic one. And for the sake of perspicuity, it could be safely replaced with it stands fast for me, as well as for anyone else, that their name is. Here, mistake is impossible. I can't be wrong about that, and so on. The third criterion for hinginess, as it were, is that hinges uh, cannot be doubted. Because all our evidence uh, speaks in favor of them or indeed uh, uh, can play the role of evidence only if we take them for granted and none speaks against them. For the reasons that I alluded to previously. And finally, the fourth criterion that needs a little bit of elaboration is that we acquire these propositions, these hinges, as part of an image of the world about it, as he calls it, uh, that we inherit from the upbringing we receive as members of a community that shares the language and various epistemic practices. Notice that this fourth criterion, as it were, by itself, wouldn't do. I mean, there are a lot of things that we absorb just by being part of a community that shares the language and whatever. So, you know, if you are born and raised in Southern California, you might absorb with being part of that community and living in that part of the world uh, at this moment in history that, um, I don't know, um, the no weather. Water. Sorry? There's no water. There's no water. <laughs> but, you know, uh, that wouldn't be a hinge. No. That might be an empirical <laughs> generalization <laughs> holding in, in some place. Or, you might think that um, you know you absorb with with that with being part of that community that you can make a turn a right turn even if the traffic light is red provided the number is coming <laughs> uh, your way um, but that that is a, just a different convention about how to go about you know driving in in, in, in the traffic it doesn't turn it into a hinge right. So uh, the mere <coughs> fact that we acquire certain things just by being immersed in a community is neither here nor there. It plays a role in this kind of context only when the other, as it were, three main criteria are also satisfied. OK, so that's the background. And I want to basically use this template, these ideas about, about hinges, to see whether the examples that Wittgenstein gives in uncertainty, like two times two equals four, would, uh, would qualify. <coughs> so, first I will carry out the discussion, taking for granted Wittgenstein's conception of mathematical propositions as rules, whose meaning is determined by their proof, etc. Um, and I would then consider if there could be mathematical hinges as opposed to ordinary mathematical propositions on a more traditional understanding of mathematical propositions as statements about natural numbers, in the case of arithmetic, which are either true or false and whose meaning is not established by their proof, let's say. Whether or not that is Wittgenstein's view or whatever, I'm, I'm now going to try to offer an interpretation of, of his views about uh, the philosophy of mathematics. So let us start by considering whether 2 times 2 equals 4 would satisfy the first criterion. Clearly it would, at least in the sense that if I think that there are two pairs in each package and I know I've got two packages, if by counting I reach the result that I have five pairs in total, while no one has matched with my pairs, I will conclude that I have miscounted and not that it might, after all, be the case that 2 times 2 equals 5. Yet, I would claim the same would 
would hold for a different uh, uh, mathematical proposition. So it's too long to read. I'll say that, okay? So similarly, if, you know, uh, I found out by counting that I end up with 228,313 apples, I would say, well, I have miscounted rather than saying that that is wrong. Okay. Of course, the second one, not being such a simple multiplication, um, is such that I could double check it. But once I have double checked that calculation, if I counted 228,313 apples, I would conclude that I have made a mistake in counting, now, assuming that nobody messed with my apples, and not that it might, after all, be false. Um, so, being rules, neither um, 2 times 2 equals 4, nor that multiplication would be true, or else, if they were, they would both be true in an entirely empty way. Let us now move to the second criterion. The kind of verification when we are concerned with when mathematical propositions are at stake is not an empirical one. We don't hold that 2 times 2 equals 4 as the result of an empirical generalization. That is, we don't hold that because by counting two apples in each of two boxes several times, we have always arrived at 4. In the mathematical case, a verification would have to be a proof, as Wittgenstein himself repeats in Uncertainty 563. However, if that is the case, we may just as well prove that 2 times 2 equals 4, or that that multiplication holds. Furthermore, the evidence I would have for 2 times 2 equals 4, namely the proof, would be as certain as the one I would have for that multiplication. The latter, again, may be a little bit more laborious, but it wouldn't be any different, and certainly not any less certain than the former. To that, one may object that the relevant evidence need not be a form of proof, but could be something like counting. If so, one may maintain that it wouldn't be any more certain that I've counted four apples while counting the apples in my packages than that two times two equals four. By contrast, counting up to 228,312 apples in the other case, would be more certain than doing the multiplication, because the multiplication is so complicated. To which I would reply, it depends. Typically, young children, and I have a couple of those at home, who learn multiplications and multiplication tables after learning how to count, would go through a phase in which they would feel more certain about the latter about counting than about the firm <coughs> multiplication. But that should normally change <coughs> after a while, once they have become conversant with multiplication tables, or indeed with multiplication techniques. And I, for one, would feel much more certain about doing the multiplication, that big multiplication up there, than about counting, or my ad was up to that big number, for counting would be more subject, in my view, to the possibility of miscounting. I might you know, count the same apple twice, or forget one apple, or repeat the same number as I go on counting one after the next. But what is more, these are entirely psychological or subjective senses of being certain, and clearly Wittgenstein is not concerned with subjective certainty when hinges are concerned, as he says many times in uncertainty. Considering now whether these alleged mathematical hinges, like 2 times 2 equals 4, would have to be presupposed for us to have any mathematical evidence that it be a proof of counting, it seems clear that this isn't so. We can count without holding fast to these elementary propositions, and the form of proof would not depend on taking them for granted. Of course, if we are considering complex multiplications like that one, having learned by rote basic ones like 2 times 2 equals 4, we we'll certainly expedite our calculations if we do them as we, I take it, were taught how to do them in school. If we were using the method that Severin was presenting yesterday, we wouldn't even need to go about 2 times 2 equals 4 in calculating something 
of that kind. But so knowing two times two equals four would certainly expedite our calculations, but they wouldn't be impossible without relying on or taking for granted those basic uh, 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 operations. Thus. For this very same reason, alleged mathematical hinges, contrary to real hinges, need not be presupposed to resolve mathematical doubts. In that sense, they would fail to comply with criterion three for being a hinge. Yet it remains that, after going through usual acculturation processes, two times two equals four would stand fast for me and for all of us, and that nothing we know would seem to speak against such a proposition. Finally and connectedly, it is true that 2 times 2 equals 4 is passed on to us as part of our world picture in the sense that it is an elementary <coughs> modification we have been shown hundreds of times. In that sense, we are certainly more familiar with it than with that multiplication over there. And that example meets <coughs> condition 4 for being a hinge. However, it is also part of our picture that more complex multiplications can be made utilizing simple techniques we all learn in school, or that they can be made quite easily by using a calculator. Obviously, that wasn't something that would, have, you know, would be true for victims, and but for us it is. True, <coughs> it is more likely that we test the reliability of a calculator by seeing what it does when we input 2 times 2. And if it gives us 5, we say, well, there's something wrong with the calculator. Rather than inputting uh, uh, the, 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 the part on the left hand side of the identity sign. Yet again, this is simply a function of how familiar we are with that multiplication. That is, there is nothing that prevents us, in principle, from using the ladder multiplication to test the reliability of the calculator. If we were trained differently, if we were like those people that can calculate very big multiplications very easily, and so they exist, and that was the practice as it were, we could test the reliability of the calculator by using that thing rather than two times two equals four. So the fact that we use 2 times 2 rather than that multiplication doesn't point to any substantive difference between these two arithmetical propositions. That is, it cannot be used to mark a difference in kind between those multiplications, but only in degree of familiarity and complexity. Typically, however, hinges are not just different from ordinary empirical propositions in their degree of familiarity or complexity, but for good concern, different in kind or they exhibit those features one, two, three, while ordinary empirical propositions do not. Yet, in the mathematical case, given Wittgenstein's own understanding of mathematical propositions and of hinges, we haven't found a way of defending the idea that among mathematical propositions, there would be some that would partake of one, two, and three, while others wouldn't. So, I submit, we haven't found a way of characterizing the distinction between mathematical hinges and non-hinges. Let us now consider a more traditional conception of mathematics according to which mathematical propositions are statements about natural numbers, in the case of arithmetic, which are either true or false, and whose meaning is not established by their proof, to see whether it could help us draw a distinction between mathematical hinges and non-hinges. Let me see if that's, yeah, okay. Mathematical hinges should stand out because contrary to other mathematical statements, there would be rules rather than descriptions of mathematical states of affairs. Hence, they alone would be neither true nor false, or if true, they would be true only in an empty sense of the term while ordinary mathematical statements would not be true in an entirely empty sense of the term when in fact true. Connectedly, mathematical hinges could not be evidentially supported, that is proved, while other mathematical statements, the ordinary ones, would be provable, and when proved, they would count as true in a substantive sense of the term, albeit in an evidentially constrained one rather than in a correspondent fashion. Moreover, they would, be, they would have to be presupposed by anything we regard as evidence in mathematics, and for that reason they could not be doubted. For a, a, any reason to doubt them would presuppose them. Finally, they alone would have to be part of the world picture we have inherited by being trained within our community. 
Now, while we can certainly conceive of such a contrast, so we can draw out this conceptual contrast between ordinary mathematical propositions and mathematical hinges, so between mathematical hinges and non-hinges, it is quite clear that, again, the examples chosen by Wittgenstein, like 2 times 2 equals 4, or 12 times 12 equal, equals 144, would not be good examples of the relevant category. For why should they be rules rather than descriptions of mathematical states of affairs such that they, sh they should be considered neither true nor false or true only in an empty sense of the term? After all, they too would be provable and would not be themselves presupposed by any proof for the reasons we saw before. Hence, they would be knowable on this understanding of mathematical statements and dubitable just like the A multiplication we had before. Of course, we are more familiar again with these propositions uh, as a result of our enculturation within a community that passes them on, on to us since very early on. But as before, this is not by itself enough to turn them into categorically distinct mathematical statements. So I submit on the Wittgensteinian account of mathematics, the very distinction between mathematical hinges and non-hinges can hardly be drawn. On a more traditional understanding of mathematics, in contrast, that distinction can be drawn conceptually, but then it cannot be exemplified by appealing to the mathematical statements that Wittgenstein mentions in Uncertainty, and that should allegedly count as examples of mathematical hinges. For again, apart from criterion four, they do not meet any of the criteria that single out hinges from non-hinges for Wittgenstein. <coughs> in at the end of this talk, I will propose to exemplify that distinction differently. So maybe there is a way of recovering the idea that there could be certain mathematical statements that play a hinge role vis-a-vis -vis the rest of mathematical statements, as it were. But for now, I just want to expand on what I think is the role that these examples play, these mathematical examples play in uncertainty. Contrary to what several interpreters have maintained, and <clears throat> I don't think we can consider Wittgenstein's mathematical examples in uncertainty <coughs> as instances of mathematical hinges. That raises the question of why he considered them, or what role they played within the context of that work. I have a fragment of this, so maybe you know, there are always people that would like to come up with stories about uncertainty given that it's a collection of notes put together by the, by the trustees. Um, the suggestion I would like to explore is that they have an elucidatory function. By comparing hinges to these mathematical examples, Wittgenstein, in my view, aims to bring out important features of hinges while not going as far as holding that there would be that they would be cases of mathematical hinges. Indeed, in one of the remarks in which mathematical examples are introduced, Wittgenstein invites us to make a comparison, and this is uh, of uncertainty for I'm in 47. Compare with this, namely the example, this is my hand, that it takes from more, notoriously. Compare with this 12 times 12 equals 144. Here too, in the mathematical case that is, we don't say perhaps. For insofar as this proposition rests on our not miscounting or miscalculating and our senses not deceiving us as we calculate, both propositions, the arithmetical and the physical one, are on the same level. I want to say the physical gain is just as certain as the arithmetical. Notice that here between says not taking 12 times 12 equals 144 for granted. Rather, is introducing it as a simple arithmetical equation that we may calculate, presumably by writing it down, or that we may resolve by counting. These processes, however, would themselves rely on the fact that our senses, while we carry them out, do not perceive us, that objects don't disappear as we, <coughs> as we go about things, that the, 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 the figures on the, on the piece of paper don't change, and so on and so forth. 
Thus, the arithmetical proposition, which is so certain for us, is seen as the result of a process that presupposes the existence and the stability of physical objects, let them be signs on piece of paper or apples or pears in boxes we may be counting, as well as the reliability of memory as we go along. And he actually mentions that in Uncertainty 337. Furthermore, Wittgenstein himself warns us that the comparison could lead to some misunderstanding, for he continues, but this can be misunderstood. My remark is a logical and not a psychological one. I take it that with this caveat, Wittgenstein is pointing out that the certainty we display with respect to this is my hand is not ultimately of a psychological kind. That is, it's not because we are very familiar with that proposition, or indeed with 12 times 12 equals 144, that, as he puts it, it's a quote, the physical gain is just as certain as the arithmetical one. Rather, it is due to the role that that proposition, uh, yes, the hand, or the mathematical one, plays with, it, with respect to uh, language and further human activities. And I'll return to this issue. So the point of the analogy between hinges like this is my hand and 12 times 12 equals 144 is to familiarize the reader of uncertainty with the idea that contrary to a typically Cartesian picture of certainty, propositions about our bodies and our physical surroundings can, at least in context, be as certain as arithmetical statements. In other words, the purpose of the analogy is clearly therapeutic. For Wittgenstein aims to dislodge the idea <clears throat> that propositions about material objects are always open to doubt, as opposed to propositions of arithmetic or as opposed to traditional philosophical truths such as the Cartes cogito, or indeed to propositions uh, of other uh, belonging to other classes that philosophers in the tradition have identified as absolutely certain uh, as opposed to the ones about physical <coughs> objects and that they have tried to put at the foundations of knowledge. By so doing, is going against all tra traditional foundationist projects in epistemology. And in this particular series of passages, is achieving his aim by stressing the similarities between propositions about physical objects and arithmetical ones, to bring out the strength, as it were, of the firmer of the physical ones, at least in certain contexts and the fact that they are indubitable, just as we find it indubitable that 2 uh, times 2 equals 4. Wittgenstein uh, reiterates uh, and reinforces the idea in the following passage, Uncertainty 448. I want to say, if one doesn't marvel at the fact that the propositions of arithmetic, like multiplication tables, are absolutely certain, then why should one be astonished that the proposition, this is my hand, is so equal? Or to repeat, the arithmetical propositions too, for Wittgenstein, are obtained through processes like calculation and counting, which presuppose the existence and stability of physical objects, as is stressed in the previous passage, and which are themselves subject to error. Yet we don't seem to be preoccupied by this fact in the mathematical case. So why should we be worried about this possibility in the case of this is my hand, at least in a more like context? So Wittgenstein is indirectly introducing the idea that he develops in subsequent passages that just because a doubt about the existence of my hand is logically or indeed metaphysically possible, that doesn't make it any less certain that in a more like context there is indeed my hand here. It then modulates the original idea by bringing in the context of teaching and learning by writing in Uncertainty 449, something must be taught as a foundation. And similarly in 455, he writes, we learn with the same inexorability that this is a chair as that 2 times 2 equals 4. Which is important to stress another analogy between the physical and the arithmetical, as it were, gain. Namely, that certain judgments, either about physical objects or about arithmetic, are passed on to us from very early on, and that we swallow, as he says in Uncertainty 143, we swallow them both without questioning either of them. Why is this important? 
Uh, Wittgenstein insists on, uh, well, we'll get there in a moment. Wittgenstein insists on two key ideas. First, that certain judgments are taught as paradigmatic cases of correct applications of terms or of calculus, such that where they wrong, if they were wrong, we would no longer know the meaning of the words we are using or what multiply and calculating could be or would be. Secondly, he points out that we use certain objects to ostensibly define the meaning of our terms. For this reason, the doubt that doubted everything, like the doubt is that here's my hand, would not be a doubt at all because the words, like, oh, is it really true that there is a hand here? The words figure in it would just have an appearance of meaning. That is, if I seriously doubted in a more like context that this is my hand, it would become unclear what I meant by hand. Therefore, my doubt, is this really a hand, would only have an appearance of meaning. But would in fact be meaningless. And I think that is what so called therapeutic readings of uncertainty got right. Thus, by uncertainty 450, the therapeutic aim of the analogy has been fully achieved by showing that, in more like contexts, this is my hand is just as certain as 12, time 12, uh, 12 times 12, when it is equal to 144. For to doubt of it would deprive words of their meaning thus making that doubt nonsense, just as doubting that 2, 12 times 12 equals 144 would deprive us of our multiplication techniques by means of which we, any doubt about mathematical statements of the same sort could be resolved. So the impossibility of a mistake and the understanding of where such an impossibility comes from are then the main themes in a series of passages starting at uncertainty 651. Where Wittgenstein writes, I cannot be making a mistake about 12 times 12 equals 144. And now one cannot, my emphasis, contrast mathematical certainty with the relative uncertainty of empirical propositions. For the mathematical proposition has been obtained by a series of actions that are in no way different from the actions of the rest of our lives and are in the same degree liable to forgetfulness, oversight, and illusion. Now, both arithmetical statements and hinges like this is my hand are grounded, as we have seen, in human activities. But they are removed from doubt and inquiry for, um, for Wittgenstein. Since this is clear in the, or clearer in the arithmetical case, likening this is my hand to 12 times 12 equals 144 helps us see the revolutionary point about the certainty of a firmer kind of proposition Wittgenstein is making, and that he condenses in Uncertainty 653, where he writes, if the proposition 12 times 12 equals 144 is exempt from doubt, then two must no mathematical propositions be. And he immediately considers possible objections, which would maintain the more traditional view according to which uh, that mm, statement, the mathematical one, would be more certain than here's a hand, because it is a mathematical proposition. So sometimes we, we might be impatient and say, oh, look, that is mathematical, that is a mathematical, so that is certain, that one, the other one is not. Yet this fact, just pointing to the fact that the letter is a mathematical proposition, but by itself is irrelevant for Wittgenstein, who insists on the conventional elements of mathematical activity, by stressing that the inexorability of mathematical statements is the result of a human decision. He writes in Uncertainty 655, the mathematical proposition has, as it were, officially been given the stamp of incontestability. And it does use the metaphor of hinges to bring out or stress this point, for it continues, dispute about other things. This is immovable. It is a hinge on which our dispute can turn. So from that, a lot of interpreters of uncertainty have taken their lead to say, look, there are mathematical hinges. Yet, I claim, the use of the hinge metaphor should not delude us into thinking that simple arithmetical statements are, in fact, hinges. Rather, it is meant to bring out the analogy between hinges and mathematical statements, all of them, 
by stressing that the incontestability of mathematical statements is not of superior status than that of this is my hand, at least in context. Just as he stressed this very same point before by reminding us of the fact that the mathematical statement is the result of the calculation which presupposes the existence and stability of physical objects and is in principle open to error and delusion, just as seeing or seeming to see a hand. And again, he's now making the same point by stressing the element of decision and in a sense, very minimal sense of arbitrariness that makes mathematical statements exempt from doubt. That is, we could go on asking and inquiring whether it is really the case that 12 times 12 equals 144, uh, or um, that this is my hand uh, in more like situations. But even if this is possible in principle, we do not do it. That we do not do it, that we do not go on questioning that in the mathematical case is clear. And once we bring that in view and we start seeing this is my hand in this new perspective as, as playing a role similar to the one of mathematical statements, it becomes clear in the physical case too. That this is the point of the analogy, it is quite clear in Uncertainty 657, where he writes, the propositions of mathematics might be said to be fossilized. The proposition, I'm called is considering that as an example of hinge, or in this case, should be witness, of course, is not. But it too is regarded as incontrovertible by those who, like myself, have overwhelming evidence for it. And this is not out of hopelessness now. For the evidence is being overwhelming consists precisely in the fact that we do not need to give way before any contrary evidence. And so we have here a trust similar to the one that makes the propositions of mathematics incontrovertible. Now these various things here. First, that Wittgenstein is not talking about a subset of mathematical propositions, that is, alleged mathematical hinges. He's talking about mathematical propositions in general, which we regard as certain even in the face of contrary evidence, like in the case of counting five apples, or indeed, 228,313 apples after multiplying either 2 times 2 or 1057 times 216. And second, just as these mathematical propositions are fossilized for them, which means that we would rather think that either we have miscounted or that someone has messed with our apples, so my name is, in my case I is a believer, in your case you plug in yours, is practically fossilized for each of us, at least most of the times. That is, we would normally recuse any evidence that we might have been mistaken about our own names. For that would entail that everything that we have been told by family members or that we might have seen written in official documents throughout our life would be wrong. Now, such a terrible prank could have been pulled on us, of course, but it is very, very, very unlikely. That is why we are most of the times entitled to treat my name is Annalisa Koliva on par with two, two times two equals four, or indeed with the other multiplication. Yet a difference remains between the two cases, in my view. For my name is, is mostly or normally or practically, if you will, fossilized for each of us, while those mathematical statements are officially or always, as it were, so fossilized. That is why we might think of them as being necessarily true. But for Wittgenstein, their superior strength would only be a function of a more definitive decision, as it were, and would not be grounded in anything like the metaphysical necessity of mathematical statements. As he writes, doubt gradually loses its sense in Uncertainty 56. My name is Annalisa Koliva, and 2 times 2 equals 4, or indeed the other mathematical um, big multiplication I had on the screen before, are very close on this continuum for Wittgenstein, <coughs> contrary to what traditional epistemologists or indeed philosophers of mathematics might have thought. Yet they are still somewhat different, even though such a difference for Wittgenstein doesn't in any way justify or leave the door open to skeptical assaults. 
and the rest of uncertainty till the final remark in Uncertainty 676 about the very intelligibility of the dreaming hypothesis is intended as dismantling the possibility, or better, the intelligibility of a radically skeptical doubt about propositions like here's my hand, or indeed my name is Annalisa Kulila in these circumstances. You know, if I suffered a yeah, car, a stroke, typically being asked your name is a test for seeing whether you are still cognitively <coughs> capable or not. So to sum up, far from proposing the idea that could be mathematical hinges as opposed to mathematical non-hinges, or even that mathematical propositions and propositions about physical objects, or our own names and many others, are absolutely identical, at least in context. Wittgenstein is just trying, in my opinion, to dislodge the idea that they are completely different, such that a radical doubt about the, the you know, here's my hand, or my name is Annalisa Koliba, could be intelligible after all. It is perhaps worth connecting this finding with a reminder about Wittgenstein's peculiar methodology, namely a methodology that by eliminating similarities and differences between apparently distant objects aims at once to achieve a perspicuous representation of them while dismantling long-lasting philosophical misrepresentations of them. If Wittgenstein is right, then we do have certainty outside the mathematical realm as well as outside the realm of pure ratiocination, like the capital, or of our inner world. This certainty is a function of the normative role certain propositions play, both in the sense of being in constitutive norms and of being norms of, uh, of, as we saw, evidential significance, at least in context, which makes them impervious to skeptical souls. To like them liken them to mathematical propositions that wear these features on their sleeves, as it were, helps us represent them correctly and see more clearly why they would be unassailable. Mm -hmm. For skeptical doubts would ultimately, ultimately be irrational, that is unsupported by evidence and reasons, and even meaningless, since reasons for them and even the possibility of stating them would presuppose those changes <coughs> that attempt to attack. And so for, that's why for Wittgenstein, skeptical doubts are ultimately delusional or equivalently merely illusions of doubt. And now, um, so that is a, a, the, the, the summary of, of this section. I'll, I come to the last section of my paper, which in five minutes, which, uh, uh, which is about how we might want to develop the idea that there are, might be, after all, mathematical hinges. So if we go back to the kind of contrast we introduced before between ordinary mathematical propositions and hinges on a rather traditional understanding of mathematics, it is not that difficult to see how it could be instantiated. For clearly mathematical, <coughs> mathematical theories axioms could be taken to fulfill the law of hinges. To be more precise, let us look at the contrast once more. We said that mathematical hinges, if they existed, should stand out because contrary to other mathematical statements, they, would, they and they only would have to be rules rather than, rather than descriptions of mathematical states of affairs. Hence, they alone would be neither true nor false or would be true only in an empty sense of the term. <coughs> Connectedly, they alone could not be evidentially supported that is true while other mathematical statements would be provable. Um, moreover, they would have to be presupposed by anything we regard as evidence in mathematics, and for that reason they couldn't be doubted, for any reason to doubt them would presuppose them. And finally, they alone would have to be part of the world picture we have inherited by being trained within our community. Now, consider the role of accents, and I change it to an example that I'm um, personally for various reasons uh, more fond of, namely Euclidean geometry. Clearly, accents in Euclidean geometry play a meaning constitutive role, for they tell us, for instance, what a point or a line are. Furthermore, they cannot be proved within the theory what any proof proceeds from them or must take them from, from granted. Of course, uh, we know that we could use what in a theory are 
the theory's theorems and uh, use them as axioms and then derive what is normally considered to be an axiom from them. So, but that's not the issue. Whatever your set of axioms, <laughs> they are going to play a different role from the theorems. Okay. Hence, uh, there are also rules of evidential significance for they establish how something may or not be proved within a theory. For these reasons, one might hold either that they are neither true nor false, or else that they are only true in an entirely empty sense of the term. Connectively, one might also hold that within a given theory they are indubitable, because anything we regard as evidence would presuppose them, and therefore nothing within the theory could speak against them, but everything speaks for them. Finally, they might not be as commonly known as basic additions or multiplications are, yet these theories are passed on to us through enculturation within a community that assigns an important role to mathematics, understood as a highly specific scientific discipline whose rudiments, such as Euclidean geometry, uh, are imparted in school. Thus, while they are certainly not like commonsensical truisms, they are comparable to other scientific hinges we find in uncertainty, like water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, which we absorb, I take it, in school as elements of scientific theories we are exposed to. Of course, as we know, uh, uh, axioms in of Euclidean geometry might be doubted from outside the theory, as the vast issue of Euclid's parallel axioms, uh, axioms uh, axiom shows. But uh, that would resemble, in many ways, the kind of scenario Wittgenstein repeatedly envisages in uncertainty, in which we encounter people that endorse different hinges. While the treatment of that kind of hinge disagreement falls outside the scope of this paper, and I've dealt extensively with uh, hinge disagreement in other writings of mine, the important point is that we have found a way not only of making sense of the distinction between hinge and non-hinge mathematical propositions, that is, we can conceptualize the difference at least, but also I take it for example finding. Whether this is a viable conception of the relationship between mathematical axioms, axioms and non-axioms is not the present issue. To remain within Wittgenstein's scholarship, however, it is clear that the present account would have important repercussions on the assessment of Wittgenstein's philosophy of mathematics, at least regarding the Vulgata uh, concerning his views. For if what I've been saying is along the right lines, then not all mathematical statements would be rules, and axioms would be, and they would play a hinge-like role with respect to other mathematical statements, the, uh, the theorems. The latter, contrary to the Vulgata regarding Wittgenstein's conception of mathematics, would be true if proved, or false if not proved, or something incompatible with them uh, uh, were indeed proved. So these further propositions uh, would not be true in an entirely empty sense of the term, but in quite robust, is in an evidentially constrained sense of true. Furthermore, on the axioms would be indubitable, at least if one remains within a given mathematical theory, for no evidence within the theory could speak against them, and everything which is regarded as evidence within the theory would speak for them. Furthermore, while ordinary mathematical propositions that are proved would be meaningful and true, or fit in an evidentially constrained way, unproved mathematical <coughs> propositions could still be meaningful and such as to motivate doubts and inquiries with respect to them. Now, as you know, I'm no philosopher of mathematics, and I do not know if this conception of mathematical hinges as opposed to non-hinges could constitute the backbone of a viable philosophy of mathematics. But what I think I can say is that this is, in broad strokes, what a possible hinge philosophy of mathematics would look like.